10 years ago. A mermaid dreamed of life on the land. I've never seen a human this close before. Now her daughter dreams of the sea. You know what? Sometimes I even pretend I have fins. The Little Mermaid 2, Return to the Sea, an all-new full-length animated feature. I know this necklace means something. If no one's going to tell me, I'm going to find out for myself. The Little Mermaid 2, Return to the Sea, premiering only on video and Disney DVD. I'm too old for this. God, I haven't seen this thing in a long time. You know, there was a time when people would just pop up a video or a DVD of a classic Disney movie, and before it would start, it would always show a trailer or two of something just like that. And most of the reactions would end up being, here we go again. Out of all the companies making movies, Disney is the most fascinating and unique when it comes to the subject of sequels and follow-ups. They're not necessarily known like other studios to quickly capitalize on the success of one feature and then to immediately build an entire franchise out of it. Instead, they have a different kind of reputation with sequels, one that completely disconnects from their original animated predecessors and would gather some highly mixed results. To put it nicely, the journey of Disney's history with follow-ups is one that presents a transition that would last for many decades from refusing to doing any to having someone else do it for them to end up making their own. So what is the story of Disney sequels? Well, let's find out. Oh, and uh, before I begin, I just want to point out that I'll only be focusing on their animated sequels. The reason for making their live action successors is the same as why any other studio would. Okay, I might go into those just a bit. Of course, let's start things off at the beginning, when Walt Disney himself was in charge. When you look at the list of his movies, you may notice something interesting. Walt Disney never produced a single feature-length sequel. In fact, the only legitimate sequel Walt ever made was the 1963 follow-up to the absent-minded professor, Son of Flubber. This was because Walt was a man known to be AGAINST sequels to his movies. The only excuse for his animated characters to come back in new adventures would be for cartoons only, like with Mickey Mouse, The Three Little Pigs, Donald Duck, and all those guys. Even when Disney thought about bringing back Snow White in a cancelled project called Snow White Returns, many agreed that it was most likely meant to be just a short that would recycle a couple of deleted scenes from the original film. The closest thing that people say is an animated follow-up movie during Walt's time was The Three Caballeros, since some would consider it to be a sequel to Saludos Amigos. But even at that, calling that a sequel would be a bit of a stretch, because the only connections those two films have are that they both have Donald and Jose Carioca, they both are the result of Walt's Goodwill tour in South America, and that they're both package films. Outside of that, for the most part, it was mostly its own feature. From then on, Walt Disney would strictly create new and original movies, and even after his death, his team of animators would continue that legacy. Although the live action crew didn't really get the memo on that because when the 1970s rolled along, they were bursting out sequels of stuff like Herbie and Dexter Riley. It wouldn't be until decades later in 1990 when Disney would release their first legitimate animated sequel with The Rescuers Down Under the follow-up to the 1977 film, The Rescuers. The idea first came when the animators were pitching all sorts of ideas for future movies like a gong show, and one of them was taking characters from The Rescuers and throw them in the Australian outback. Let's see, you got a movie that was really successful in its theatrical run, and now you're putting the characters in a place where literally anything can kill you. Yeah, sure, why not? And so, on November 16th, 1990, the film was released and it was a flop, only making $28 million domestically and a worldwide total of around $47 million. However, this didn't hurt Disney at all, because when you look at their other films released at the same time as Down Under, 
I think they were doing fine. But since then, the only follow-up they made after that was Fantasia 2000, and unfortunately, even that came out as a financial flop. So for the people at Walt Disney Animation Studios, those two films only gave an additional reason for the studio to not make any more sequels from then on. However, that is only the case for that studio in particular. Trust me, our Disney sequel story is just beginning. Going back to the early 90s, their television division wanted to make an animated TV show based on their 1992 hit, Aladdin. The team originally wanted to start with a big three-parter pilot that would all play at once as a TV special, but the heads at Disney thought that it would be a better idea to take the entire pilot and sell it as a feature-length sequel releasing straight to video, since it would save the company years of time and a lot of money. Plus, it's a bonus to quickly give the demanding audiences more Aladdin. So, it really was a win-win situation. And so, Disney's first ever straight-to-home media sequel, The Return of Jafar, finally hit stores on May 20th, 1994, and some could say that it was as successful as the first film. With a budget of around $3 million, the movie managed to sell more than 4.6 million VHSs in just about a week, and ended up selling a grand total of 15 million copies that earned the company around $300 million. At the same time, the company also expanded a new division specializing in direct-to-video movies called Disney Video Premiere, led by Sharon Morrill. Now, it would be possible that Return of Jafar was just a lucky shot, so they decided to do it again two years later with another Aladdin sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, this time with Robin Williams back as the genie. However, it also became a massive hit, selling millions of copies, and that is when Disney discovered a gold mine. Between 1997 and 1998, the company released their first batch of direct-to-video sequels as a sign of what would be to come. Among them are follow-ups of Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Pocahontas, and what would be their favorite subject, Winnie the Pooh. Around that time, Morrill gained more power within the company where she became the executive vice president of pretty much all of Disney's smaller animated movie projects, including the direct-to-video films, the TV specials, and Disney Movie Tunes, the studio that would make theatrical animated features not from Disney Animation, like DuckTales the Movie and A Goofy Movie. Meanwhile, Disney was also talking with Pixar regarding another Toy Story film, and thanks to the success of Return of Jafar, they considered to have this as an opportunity to bring Pixar in the fun of direct-to-video sequels. But then, once the execs saw some footage and considered that it'll be a bit pricier to make, they decided that the movie would be good enough for theaters instead of direct-to-VHS. One insane production later that had the crew redo the entire story and finish the whole film in just nine months, the film came out at the end of 1999 and was a major success, and even to this day is among one of the highest rated movies of all time. However, Pixar was still relatively new to the movie game, so afterwards they would get back to making more original movies to sharpen up their creativity. When the 2000s rolled along, that was when the sequels were at their prime. At the most, they were capable of bringing out four to six animated follow-ups annually on a low budget that bring in some high profit. What's also interesting to note is that there were even a few that managed to get released theatrically. Yeah, most of them were Winnie the Pooh films, but then there were movies like Return to Neverland, The Jungle Book 2, and Bambi 2 in some countries that actually got a shot on the big screen, like if it was one of their main ones. Sure, some some of the movies are pretty bad, in fact, a lot of them are actually pretty bad, but what's more important is that people were still buying regardless, and Disney turned it into a billion dollar business. So at the end of the day, hey, as long as it works, am I right? In 2003, Disney was reorganizing their animation groups to have it be clearer on each of their purpose, which includes combining Disney Video Premiere and Movie Tunes to Disney Toon Studios, where it would be the definitive company that would make the direct-to-video sequels, with Sharon Morrill again being in charge as the executive vice president. However, it would come at the cost that they would eventually let go of their international animation studios like in France, Canada, Japan, and Australia to keep it all made in one place. A year later, Disney would open up a new studio called Circle 7 Animation, 
whose purpose would be like Disney Toon, but specialized in making direct-to-video sequels of Pixar films. In fact, there were a few movies that were already in development. These include Finding Nemo 2, A Monsters Inc. 2, where Mike and Sully get lost in the human world, and their version of a Toy Story 3 where the toys have to save Buzz who was shipped to Taiwan. The studio was made without the approval of Pixar, so you could imagine that they were pretty pissed about it. The sequels were having a very strong flow, but then everything would change in 2006. Bob Iger was the new CEO of Disney, and one of the first big acts was to buy Pixar for $7.4 billion, which would lead to making Ed Catmull and John Lasseter the new heads of their entire animation division, with Catmull as the president and Lasseter as the chief creative officer. Now, John made it very clear that he was not a fan of those cheap sequels, and he even noticed that they were having major problems with some productions, especially with the Tinkerbell spinoff, where the budget was getting close to $50 million. That was when the new heads ultimately decided to put an immediate halt at Disney Toon, changing up management, kicking out Morrill, and putting a stop to making any more directed video sequels, where the last one they put out was a prequel to The Little Mermaid called Ariel's Beginning in 2008. As for Circle 7, unsurprisingly, they quickly took it down and threw out all their projects. But thankfully, around 80% of their workers were moved to Walt Disney Animation Studios, so there wasn't a big loss there. However, when John stopped the sequels, there were also many follow-ups that ended up getting cancelled. These include sequels to Pinocchio, The Aristocats, Chicken Little, Meet the Robinsons, a Seven Dwarfs spin-off, and the most interesting of them all, a Dumbo 2. I say that's the most interesting because not only did it have one of the original writers, Joe Grant, return, but also this exists. Now, experience the all-new adventure of a lifetime as the classic story continues. Join us for a sneak peek behind the scenes of the production of Walt Disney's Dumbo 2. We're basically continuing our story as if, like, a day or so after the original. The kids accidentally get themselves disconnected from the rest of the circus, and they end up in the big city. They want to have this freedom, but they also have to try to figure out how they're going to get back home. The storyline and everything, where we're going, it will be all new, but I think it'll have the same flavor and feeling of the old version. The story's about friendship and parental love, and that there truly is no place like home. Coming soon from Walt Disney Pictures, Dumbo 2, premiering on Disney DVD and Video. And it will be in your collection in 2000, never gonna happen. After the big switch, Disney ultimately decided that Disney Toon will only be making spin-offs of their animated films instead of successors, with the first being the 2008 Tinkerbell. Their next spin-off wouldn't take flight until five years later with Planes, a film that is set in the world of cars that even got a sequel the following year, both of which got a theatrical release. Other than that, could you guess what Disney Toon would go on to make? More direct-to-video sequels! But it's okay, because they're all follow-ups to Tinkerbell. So that's literally just two spin-offs, and the rest are just sequels to those spin-offs. Really goes to show that the more things change, the more they stay the same. But even if John put a stop to those direct-to-video sequels, that doesn't mean he doesn't want to do any more sequels in general. When going back to Pixar, the team started to open up on the idea of making follow-ups to their own features. But what ended up happening was that they would make a lot more sequels than they initially expected. If you look at all the films Pixar released in the 2010 decade, you'll notice that most of these movies are just follow-ups and only four are original. Brave, Inside Out, The Good Dinosaur, Coco, and that's it. The rest are a Finding Nemo sequel, a Monsters, Inc. prequel, two Toy Story sequels, and two car sequels. Although most of them gathered some positive reactions, except for Cars 2, it was often agreed that most of these don't have the same legendary impact as their predecessor. However, there is one big factor to note about all these Pixar successors. Like the direct-to-video sequels, regardless of what people thought of them, 
they made a lot of money. In fact, some of them, like Toy Story 3, Finding Dory, and The Incredibles 2, are among some of the highest grossing animated features of all time, making more than a billion dollars each. And this gold rush wasn't just happening at Pixar either. Disney Animation was also making some of the biggest animated films of the decade. Because of these massive successes, and Pixar doing very well with its sequelitis, the company decided that they would be more open for Walt Disney Animation Studios to also be doing sequels as well with Wreck-It Ralph and Frozen. Especially when the latter got the crown for the highest grossing animated feature of all time. The idea of a sequel was just too irresistible for Disney. On a side note, I'm sure a lot of people would bring up the 2011 Winnie the Pooh movie and if that would count as an actual sequel. Well, to be honest, saying that Winnie the Pooh is a sequel to the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh would be the same thing as saying that The Three Caballeros is a sequel to Saludos Amigos. It's too iffy to find a legitimate conclusion. Now that Disney is ready for their main studios to make more sequels, Something happened that they were completely not ready for. A big scandal about the most powerful man in animation. What is it? Buzz Lightyear, we come in. <laughs> First thing you gotta know about me, I'm a hugger. You know, suddenly, I'm never gonna look at Lotso the same way again. On November of 2017, reports have been revealed that John Lasseter had an entire history of sexual misconduct that made Pixar an unsafe environment for the women working there. He took a leave of absence soon after, and it wouldn't be until June of 2018 that John was officially announced to be out, and that Jennifer Lee and Pete Docter would take his place at Walt Disney Animation Studios and Pixar Animation Studios, respectively. And right at at that moment, the changes were happening. A few weeks after the announcement, Disney revealed that they would be shutting down Disney Toon Studios and would lay off their 75 workers. At that time, the traction at the studio was at its lowest. They haven't released a single movie since early 2015 with Tinkerbell and the Legend of the Never Beast. They were developing another spin-off of Cars that would be set in space, but once the studio closed down, that project was pretty much dead. And thus our story comes to an end, since during the time I made this, it would be, well, I guess you would say, the end of the John Lasseter era. I think it's a good way to round things out. Overall, the Disney mindset regarding sequels went from being completely opposed to them to just embracing them and letting their old characters have another shot at the big screen. However, when the term Disney sequel would get brought up, people would first think of that period from the late 90s up to the 2000s where they would bombard the entire VHS and DVD market with low budget animated sequels. While they didn't leave a dent on the reputation of Walt Disney Animation Studios, it was a strange moment in the Michael Eisner times when the purpose of it all was more about money than quality. But one can't deny that it did work. But I can see why Disney and Pixar would later make their own official sequels. With movies like Ralph Breaks the Internet and Incredibles 2 where the makers of the first films would return to work on them, there is a hidden goal to kill off that old mentality so that the term Disney sequel can be considered a good thing in the mind of the general public. And I will say, as someone who grew up in the 90s and the 2000s, I'm glad that those direct-to-video sequels are over. I mean, it's good to know that Disney finally wised up and that they won't mass-produce any more inferior products solely for the purpose of cashing in on the fame and nostalgia of their animated classics, am I right? Right? is spreading!